so uh, why are we having a meeting about Palanza, someone who 40 years ago wrote a book that even he described as too difficult to read? Well, it's because the ideas in it are still very influential now. In uh, a lot of the debates that we encounter about do you need a new type of party, a new type of relationship to social movements, there's often ideas of Palancis in there that that draws upon. Uh, I think, if anything, his ideas becoming more influential. A, a comrade at King's College, uh, London, showed me that she'd been invited to a reading group of Palancis' last book, State Power and Socialism. And I think. Partly this is because the crisis and the, uh, the struggles against it have raised new questions that weren't necessarily on the agenda ten years ago. When I first became politically active, people would talk about can you change the world without taking power? And I think the struggles we've seen since then have raised the question that really who has power, what does it mean, who controls the state have become very relevant. But I think in particular it's because of the rise of new left parties and in particular Syriza in Greece which is a party within which uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, uh, a lot of influence of Palantza. Syriza's main think tank is called the Nikos Palantzas Institute. Um, Euclid Sakalatos, the new finance minister who's currently negotiating on um, a, a, a new deal, in his book he references Palantza as having had the answers that were needed in the 70s. I, he's also a big reference point on the Syriza left, who are very critical of the deals being negotiated. Probably some of the people in Syntagma Square on the rally against the new deal now. And partly this is because Syriza's roots and origins go back um, to the movement that, that, that Palantzis was trying to theorise and, and, and was one of the theorists <laughs> of, the Eurocommunist movement, where the, um, I, uh, I'm not going to do a whole um, meeting on the, the history of, of Eurocommunism, but in, in brief, that the um, people within the traditions of the communist parties, the, the Stalinist pro-Moscow communist parties, by the 1960s and 70s, were starting to look at a change in orientation. And partly that's because there was an upsurge of workers' struggle to relate to that was demanding, you know, political representation. But it was also partly because in the USSR and in the Eastern Bloc states there had been struggles exposing them and creating a certain disillusionment with them. And also a speech from Nikita Khrushchev, Soviet leader, saying that we need peaceful coexistence with the West. Now once the Soviet Union is calling for peaceful coexistence with the West, do you necessarily want to be in a party that's calling for the overthrow? And, 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 and revolution in the West. And so there was a lot of moves towards parties that would intervene in national politics in, 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 in Western states without necessarily having the same orientation either on the Soviet Union or on the idea of revolution. And, you know, um, in a nutshell, this didn't necessarily end very well um, when, when tested. In, in Greece, the, the country that Palantzis was from, the uh, Eurocommunist Party that split from the Communist Party wasn't actually able to break through and, uh, electorally, in, um, and you know um, ultimately found itself in alliances with the old Communist Party again. In in France, the Communist Party ended up in uh, coalition government with the uh, with Francois Mitterrand, the Union of the Left, which actually made put them in a weaker position to intervene in struggles, and uh, th they suffered for it afterwards. Um, but I think um, that that's sort of the last main reference point that a lot of people looking at new forms of parties now are looking to, that says we can draw on the Marxist tradition, but actually look at new ways of doing things. That emergence of Eurocommunism is, is a key reference point. And I think um, we can't sort of lay the blame on everything that the series of leadership does on Palantzis' theories, any more than, to borrow Palantzis' metaphor, you can blame Nietzsche for Hitler, or you can blame Jesus for the Inquisition. And I also don't pretend that in half an hour I can lay out all the complexities of, of his theories, but I do think there's a theoretical basis for some of the practical political choices people have made that's worth exploring. Um, so Palantzis, though was a Greek Marxist, was, was most active and did most of his development in the, the French left, around the French Communist Party, and particularly around a group of theorists um, led by Louis Althusser, although increasingly Palantzis came to break with Althusser and become very critical of him. Um, and uh, in some ways, his position was very much to the left of the series of leadership now, and that he was saying we should overthrow capitalism, we should be seeking to replace it. 
Um, whereas, you know, Yanis Varoufakis, the former finance minister, says we, the erratic Marxists, need to save capitalism from itself. But at the same time, some of the practical conclusions were to the right. Uh, Palantz has called for um, a coalition with PASOK, the Social Democratic Party, something that, that Syriza very much avoided doing in recent years. Um, Palantzis began his um, sort of theoretical career as a, a law student and a, a study of law and, and tried to develop a Marxist theory of law. And um, in this exposed quite a lot of the ideologies about rule of law that, that, that we have under capitalism. Um, I mean, I think people are very familiar with the argument that um, the law in capitalism is very hypocritical. You know, the citation that it forbids rich and poor alike from, from, sleeping, uh, from sleeping rough and stealing food. Um, but what Palancis also showed was that the argument about rule of law contains its own exception. In other words, that um, there's often a dichotomy posed between uh, capitalist societies in which the law is, uh, is sacrosanct and every individual has their own rights on the one hand, contrasted with totalitarian societies, which could mean fascists, could mean military dictatorships, could mean the, um, the supposedly communist countries of the Eastern Bloc, where there was no rule of law and there were no um, individual rights. And Palantir sort of showed that this dichotomy didn't really work, because what, what is the basis of the law in capitalist society? And you know you can sort of find this argued quite positively in some of the texts that inspired the bourgeois revolutionaries, the, things like Rousseau's social contract. It's sort of an argument that in order to keep people's private, separate, individual interests from conflicting with each other, you need a power that can regulate them and that therefore um, can be above them and counterposed to them, and that this is the public interest. And once you've created that counterposition, uh, what, where do individual rights stand actually when you've got something above them claiming to be the public interest that guarantees them by holding them down you know there's actually and it's terrifying in some ways reading in the social contract some of the things Rousseau calls for the state's powers seems very much unlimited and this is part of Palantis's argument that, um, that therefore there isn't some sudden leap between society, between legalistic capitalism and individualism and totalitarian societies. In fact, totalitarianism doesn't really work as a category um, because bourgeois capitalism, uh, you know, contains within it all the seeds for this. And also in terms of the um, dictatorships in the Eastern Bloc that called themselves communist, where they were most totalitarian was also where they were most capitalist. I mean, he didn't go as far as we would in, in, in having an analysis of state capitalism. But he said that, um, that you know, workers were exploited, uh, workers were denied control of uh, production, and while this wasn't, you know, running the market, it, it was still um, capitalistic features. And that this was quite powerful. Um, but it also was his starting point for trying to develop a general theory of the state in capitalist society. Um, so he was very dissatisfied with what he saw as the orthodox or prevailing Marxist view of the state, which is that um, politics as a superstructure on the base of the economy um, is just passive. In other words, that what really happens is in the economy is um, on the ground between workers and their bosses. Uh, the, the state is just a sort of passive reflection of that. I don't think that is necessarily by any means what most Marxists think, but that's what Palantzis was arguing against and certainly held some sway in the Stalinist parties. And he um, pointed out that in the, in the texts of Marx and Engels and Lenin and, and some of the greats of the Marxist tradition, the state played an extremely important role. One of the phrases Marx used was that the state is the official resume of society, um, which is that the state is the thing that tries to hold together um, all the contradictions that threaten to tear capitalist society apart, and therefore you can read from what the state does what it is in the society that it's trying to overcome, and therefore you can learn a lot about how society functions by, by looking at the, the state. And there's a few concrete examples of that. I mean, one is we're in a society where the vast majority of the wealth is held in the hands of a few while it's produced by the many. Well, obviously, 
that's a society that's going to need some repression, some kinds of weapons and threats and mechanisms to stop the many reclaiming their wealth. And that this is where, why we have the police, the, the, the prisons, this system to keep the wealth from the hands of the many. And um, this is something Palantis and his co-thinkers described as, and contemporaries described as the repressive state apparatus. There's also similarly a question of ideology. If you're not going to be fighting the working class all the time, you need to have some way of convincing them that this society represents their needs. And actually, well, we do see that in, 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 on the media, in schools, to a lesser extent now, but in the church, a huge amount of effort is put into convincing people that the society they're in is one that's natural and normal and in their own interest. Um, and and uh, Palantis and his contemporaries referred to this as the ideological state apparatuses. Um, but actually that's not the only things the state does. And um, if you look at the welfare state, you know, that tells us something about capitalism as well. That actually capitalists need skilled workers in order to exploit. They need us to have a certain amount of health and education. But at the same time, capitalism impoverishes workers. It, it you know, bleeds us dry and tries to pay people as little as possible. And the state tries to compensate for this and bring this together as well. Um, there's other examples I can, I can bring. So the state has an extremely important role. And um, Marx also talked about the importance of political class struggle as being the thing through which classes take on real form. In other words, he talked about classes existing in the economy. Uh, for example, the working class produces the wealth, the bourgeoisie extracts it from them. But actually, you only see that class as a social force one struggles with overall political demands, bring it together and start to cohere it. And this is something that I think is very interesting in a lot of Marx's commentaries on histories, and certainly something that Palantzis wanted to take from. And Palantzis pointed out that Marx, you know, in the Communist Manifesto, he describes the state as the, the managing committee of the whole bourgeoisie, but in general, there isn't a sort of Marxist theory of the state that Marx lays out in a, a formal explained way, in the way that capital is the, the theory of the economy, for example. What, what Marx did do was study some of the political crises that were going on uh, during his lifetime and see what they told him. And one of the most influential, and certainly for, for Palantzis the most influential, was studying the political crisis in France from 1848 to 1851, from the, the Second French Revolution to the, the coup that ended it. And it began with a revolution against the uh, despotic king and, uh, and, and, and monarchy that involved the workers, it involved the petty bourgeoisie, and it involved the, um, the bourgeois, you know, Democrats and, and Republicans. But as soon as it had won and got rid of the old establishment and established a, 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 a bourgeois republic, that republic turned on the workers' movement uh, that had got it there and suppressed it, and there was immense violence. More than uh, around 3,000 insurgents believed to have been killed, 18,000 deported. Now you might think then, end of story. The bourgeoisie has overthrown the old rulers and suppressed the challenge from the workers that could threaten it. Actually, it wasn't the end of the story. And what was clear over the subsequent three years was that the parties of the bourgeoisie failed to form any stable government at all. They would constantly be uh, attacking each other. And um, partly Marx argued that although the things they were arguing about were partly what form of government there should be, who should be the new king if a king was restored, it actually reflected the different material interests of different parts of the capitalist class. Because actually capitalists, they don't just exploit workers, they also compete with each other. And different sections of capital, industrial, commercial, financial, agricultural, you know, they have different policies that would benefit them most. And in a system based on competition, that's quite hard to manage, actually. And the only way they could find to coexist was to have a, a, a parliamentary republic that they could say this represents everyone's interest, not just one class, it represents everyone, and through that we'll work out our difference. The problem with that was that it wasn't just capitalists that, that, that had parties, there was also a challenge from 
from middle uh, from parties rooted in the middle class with more democratic aspirations that they couldn't stand. And in the end, the parties of the bourgeoisie ended up supporting the old party of order that had represented the old order they'd overthrown. Even it couldn't stabilise things. And what you have three years after the revolution is a coup d'etat led by the nephew of Napoleon, and Marx's commentary on this is the origin of the phrase, first as, uh, first as tragedy, then as farce, um, that's actually incredibly hostile to the bourgeois political parties, you know, attacks their meetings and things. He, his, his movement is actually built on the peasantry, and the, 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 particularly the small and the poor peasants, and he uses those as a support base to, to claim power. Once he's got it, though, it's absolutely not the interests of the small peasants that his regime represents. It's the interests of capitalism, and French capitalism does better under this, um, you know, under this dictator supported by the peasants than it had under the supposedly capitalist parties. And Palancis argues that this, this is Marx's analysis of that crisis, but that it also tells us something far more general about capitalist society. And to an extent, he's in good company with this. I mean, Marx describes this um, as being the religion of the bourgeoisie. Lenin, years later, studying it, says that those crises in France that Marx was studying tells us about the whole history of capitalism condensed into a short time. And Palantzis develops from this his theory of the relative autonomy between politics and economics. In other words, that the people who are in control politically in control of the state in capitalism are not necessarily the ones in control of, of, of the economy and that that has a lot of implications. Um, I mean you can compare the capitalist state to what would exist in feudalism whereas now you, you can see a very clear separation in many ways that you know someone can have huge economic power be, being the boss of a major company and might well not, not have any direct political influence whatsoever that's not always the case but it can be and you could have a prime minister who comes from any background, you know, who, who isn't necessarily a scion of the ruling class. In feudalism, it would be the same people. The duke is the duke, whether you're, you're going for a complaint about production or, or about something more general. So this is a unique feature of capitalism. And the situation in France isn't the only time Marx talks about a, um, about a disjuncture. He describes the, the party, the Whigs in Britain, who uh, were the leading party in, in British parliamentary politics for many years as being a party of the aristocracy acting as the clerks for the bourgeoisie, the clerks for the bourgeoisie. And of course the, the Nazis were uh, the party that seized power in Nazi Germany. This was a party that, that had its origins in, 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 the, uh, in the middle class primarily. <coughs> and so the state can be in, a different, uh, in the hands of a different class than the capitalists and still be a capitalist state. And what Palantis also described was splits within the state and within the, 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 the ruling classes. I mean, in the state bureaucracy, you'd say that the class that controls the heights of it, the top civil servants, be they the capitalists, the aristocrats, whatever in the different situations, is one thing. The ordinary civil servants at the base are more likely to be drawn from the middle class. And he actually argued that the more the bureaucracy of the state grew, the more that its role would partly be giving jobs to people who would once have been in the peasantry in the middle class and that they would have quite a different interest potentially to those at the top. Mm -hmm. And going back to the situation in France that you wouldn't necessarily just have one class that rules. You might have a collection of different fractions of capitalism, of capital, the, the industrial, the, the financial, or indeed potentially bits of other classes as well, ruling in what he called a power block that would have divisions between itself as well as with, with broader society. Um, and that sometimes, well, and, and that the, the way they would use the state would have to overcome these divisions between them and impose the interests of one class within the power block over the others. And that it could even be the case that the state would impose the interests of the dominated class was Palantis's words, so if the workers of the middle class, of the peasants, of the people who aren't in power, could impose their interests on the dominant class. Um, using the example perhaps of the welfare state, it could the state can impose reforms that seem to benefit those of us who are not in power, even in the face of the opposition 
of many of the, those in the ruling class if that's actually what's in, in, their, in their interest. And going back to the, the comments that the, of, of the description of the state as bringing together all the contradictions in society, well, actually, if the state represents a contradiction, Palantis argued, it's absurd to then say it's all in the hands of one, one class. Actually, all the classes are represented in it because it's a social relation, it's a contradiction. Both sides are in it, and therefore it's a site of struggle. There is struggle inside the state, as well as the broader economy um, and broader society. And thus, when we talk about the power that's used, that, that seems to be exercised by the state, that's not the power of the state. That's the power of classes. It's classes that are wielding that power. They're using the state to do it. And the way... Um, <coughs> And the way in which this is achieved, the way in which the ruling class um, tries to cement its, its, its control over the state and through that over society, is, um, is through representing its interests as the general will of everyone. And, um, you know, through this, actually, Plantus argues that democracy and representation are the most efficient ways in which they can do this. And when he talks in more detail about dictatorships and authoritarian societies, he says not only do they do this, try and do the same thing as democracies, but their response of the ruling class to a crisis, and that they don't actually do its job as well as them, and that, that, that they're more fragile, that they're more weak and brittle and able to break. Um, we argue he's what, allow, what makes it possible for those ruling society to claim to represent everyone's interests well, it's precisely the illusion that says we're all just a society of individuals interacting with other individuals and therefore it takes something above us to represent the general interest. That's nothing like the reality. In fact, Palantis argues that society is becoming more centralised into different classes, not less. That, you know, like capitalism, as Marx described it would, big firms are swallowing up smaller ones, the economy is becoming more centralised, production is becoming more socialised in big workplaces. So how do you create this illusion in that context that it's all about individuals interacting? And that's a huge part for Palantis of the state's role, of the, of the use of the law and its ideology, the way in which labour contracts are drawn up as an exchange between two individuals. He called this the isolation effect. He says this is what the state does, is it tries to create a sense of isolation that makes us feel like we're just individuals and need a, a general will to, to represent us. Um, what limits the state's autonomy? Because he described a limited, uh, sort of relative autonomy between politics and economics. What, what's the relative bit? What's the limit? Well, Palantis described the economic level of society as dominant and in the last case determinant. What that means for our purposes is that the limits of what's possible is set in the economy and is set you know, between struggles that aren't necessarily interacting on the state at all, um, between workers and their bosses and, um, and, um, uh, and, and, and social struggles more generally. I mean, he would later talk about not only the workers' movement having its autonomy, but talk about other social movements having autonomy as well. The examples he used, the women's movement, the ecological movement, these are the three flags on the, the series of logo, has three colours of flags. They represent the workers' movement, the women's movement, and the ecological movement, re referring back to this. Um, and so he argued that what happens in the economic and more broadly social level determines the limits within which the political struggle and the struggle within the state, um, the limits within which it's possible, um, and that to go beyond those limits, the ruling class has to use the state to change the, the, that, that broader social context, to change the economy, or, or what have you. And in many ways, reading Palantzas is hugely refreshing after reading Althusser, who he broke with. Because in Althusser, you get a constant sense that everything's fixed, and it's almost impossible for the masses to challenge it. You, you should sort of be terrified by this monolith you can't move. Palantzas, it almost flips the other way, that you have this really fragile network of, of um, alliances and blocks 
tied together by these really <coughs> complex strategies and it can often feel like it would just take a flick and the whole thing brings down. That's a caricature of his position but he emphasizes the fragility and, um, and, 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 and the, the, um, the possibility to break apart the ruling alliances and in the, in the state. And in, this was sort of the basis for his program for democratic socialism. His, his argument for how you, um, you, know, how you should uh, respond to, to, to this setup and, and, and trying to change it. And he argued against what he described as the dual power strategy. Dual power, of course, a reference to the Russian Revolution, where workers who were involved in the revolution, who'd had disputes with their bosses, certainly in the workplace, who'd also been involved in political struggles to topple the Tsar, the Tsar and fight with the provisional government that came out of it, they had their own workers' councils, the Soviets, that came out of that, that were very much counterposed to the state, that were an alternative centre of power, and that were um, ultimately what, what was able to replace the state when, when the revolution was completed. Palancer says this is wrong for two reasons. First of all, it's a denial of the genuine aspects of democracy's ability, of bourgeois democracy's ability to represent everyone. If you deny general representation, then actually you are leading the way to a, a certain type of dictatorship. And I'd argue this is partly because coming from the Stalinist tradition and always being very dismissive of Trotsky, not, not least those who followed it, I don't think he, even though he said there were capitalistic elements of the, the Eastern Bloc societies, I don't think he ever quite grasped the sense that there had been a revolution against capitalism and a counter-revolution, and that without that relationship being clear, I think he wasn't quite able um, to then rationalise dual power. But he also said it's unnecessary. If you see the state as the source of the power of a class, then of course you need to smash it to overthrow that class. If you see the state as a site of power that is internally contested and that is merely used by classes, why do you need two of them? Why not have the, the struggle inside one? And so he said dual power is the wrong way. What you need is an approach of, of, of taking the state from above and from below. In other words, going back to the, the question of the limits of, 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 of the autonomy, you need to use economic struggles, you need to use social struggles, to change the limits of what's possible politically. You then need to use a political struggle um, to advance the position of your class inside the state. And in turn, use the influence that you get through the state to try and create you know, organs of, of, of democracy in the broader economy and in the broader world. And thus have this sort of <coughs> virtuous cycle of, um, of, of, of the advance of the working class inside the state and democratization outside it. Um, now there is problems with this in practice. Um, I mean I think Palantis's predictions are very much that the divisions between the elements of the, uh, the ruling power block and of the state would polarize and diverge and to an extent this is true and I mean actually I think within the state the polarization is greater in some ways than Palantis acknowledged. I don't think the lower levels of the civil service are our petty bourgeois, our middle class. I think nowadays, when you look at the lower ranks of the civil service, you see PCS <coughs> members, Unison members, you see people who've been thoroughly proletarianised and actually who strike and who strikes you want to relate to. Um, but that's not the whole state. And actually something that comes, comes through in an interview between, um, between Poulancis and uh, Henri Weber, who was a, a, a French Trotskyist in the, um, well, the, the ancestor organization to the MPA. Um, he argued that, okay, parts of the state might polarize away from each other, but the core of the state will polarize to the right. In other words, we'll both stay together and coherent, but also not, not come over to the workers' movement, but become more strongly against it. And that what you're going to need at some point, you, you can't just hope it disintegrates, you're going to need a test of strength between that, um, between that repressive core of the state and the working class. I mean, I think we've had a little glimpse of the different types of, of polarisation 
in, in, in the ruling class almost in, in Britain in the past few years. I think if you look at things like the MPs expenses scandal, the hacking scandal, Plebgate, we've seen the pillars of the establishment having a massive go at each other. The police, the press, the political parties, people who are supposed to work together to, to repress the rest of us, tearing chunks out of each other. As soon as you saw the riots, then they were all singing from the same hymn sheet. As soon as there was the slightest threat to their, 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 their power from below, that united them and, and, and brought out the worst in all of them, supporting the, the cops beating people off the streets. Now that, that's a tiny you know, uh, challenge compared to the, what you would see in a revolution. More seriously, is that we can look at what happened to the, the popular, to the, uh, to the unity government of, the, of Salvador Allende in Chile, where you, know, you had what was a very left-wing government, backed by a huge level of mobilization from the working class, and you know, there had been several years of strikes, protests, even things that could have been the, uh, the embryo of Soviets, the, the, the Cordones committees. Um, Allende was determined to, um, to try and work things out through the, the state rather than through building these into a confrontation with it and you know, argued that everything had to be done constitutionally and that through doing things constitutionally you could reach out to the progressive elements of the ruling class that were attacking them and in particular to the progressive elements in the army. And one of the progressive elements that he appealed to was the progressive general Augusto Pinochet who, of course, you know, for all that he did talk to Allende, actually betrayed that and was the one who led the coup. Um, and Palancis described this as Chile was somewhere where not enough was done. Not enough was done to, to, to undercut the power of, of, of the bourgeoisie and to change things. But the thing is, at the same time, there was also a... Um, oh, at the same time, at the same period in Portugal, there was a revolutionary process that was to a large extent captured by social democracy and you know what, what was a moment where workers were taking very radical measures, there was mass mobilizations, there was workers control and ultimately it ended up uh, not going down a revolutionary route but into a stable you know bourgeois, um, bourgeois democracy that, that is the Portuguese government today well, Palantis criticised there that the workers had done too much to seize control themselves, that had threatened the uh, economic structures of the, of, uh, of, of, of the bourgeoisie and threatened to undermine the state that they were trying to win control of. So in other words, you can't do too much, you can't do too little. And actually, in a concrete revolutionary uh, situation, you know, forces come onto the stage that aren't quite accounted for in... in, in um, in Palantir's model, um, which in some ways ties with his view of history, which is far more subtle than I'm able to do justice to or go into. But there is an emphasis on the longer term change that, is, um, that happens alongside revolutions and that you almost get the impression that he thinks are more important than revolutions is what happens in the century running up to them and after them. Um, one of the things that really brought out some of the um, theoretical problems behind Palantis' approach was the famous Palantis Miliband debate in New Left Review, where, um, in brief, Ralph Miliband, the, the father of Ed and, and, and David, um, argued that there's actually really, really close links between the people who control the state and the ruling class. You'll often find capitalists serving as ministers. And even when you don't, you'll find people who move from politics to the civil service to the top of um, the big companies and back again <coughs> through their career, people who socialise together. But actually, this idea that they're two completely separate worlds doesn't fit. They're, they're one and the same. Um, Palancis responds that this is actually a very good way of puncturing the hypocrisy of a state that claims it rules for everyone and is actually very tied to one class, but does it explain anything? So there's no, is there any reason why the state has to have those links? And actually, arguing that it, 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 it's because of those links that it works the way it does, is that reducing class rule to a conspiracy? And that if we just get rid of the, the people who are linked to the bosses, we'll have a different type of state. So, in some ways, quite a, a devastating response to Miliband. But um, 
Chris Harmon, one of the, the leading theorists of our um, tradition, the, the international socialist tradition, um, looked back on the debate afterwards and said the problem was that both sides of the debate were right about the bits the other missed. Um, you know, uh, Palantis is absolutely right to say at Miliband, you can't just say the problem with the state is the people who are in charge of it. You need a reason why it works that way. And um, it was also... Miliband was absolutely right to say you can't pretend that they're these two completely autonomous things, that they're, 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 they're quite tied together. You need something that can uh, answer both of those objections, if you like. And he said that the, the class basis of the state isn't as complicated as all this. What does the state bureaucracy rely on to pay for itself, to exist, to feed itself? It relies on capital accumulation. In other words, the economic basis of the state is the same as that of the bosses. They have a very organic reason for coexisting. It's not that they don't share the same personnel, nor is it just that they happen to share the same personnel, it's that they have the same raison d'etre. So of course they're going to. And I think this is a reminder that for socialists, you know, sometimes we'll intervene in struggles that can seem economic with no bearing on the political immediately. You know, a struggle of workers against their boss in one place and that can seem completely separate from politics as such. And we can also intervene around things, struggles that break out politically as a protest against what the government's doing that can seem completely disconnected from the economic struggle of workers against their bosses. We engage in both of those struggles, but what we're always trying to do is bring them together. Because actually the sense that there's a separation between what happens in the state and the economy, between politics and broader society, one of the things Palantis is right about is that that separation is something that's useful to capitalism and that capitalist ideology and the structures that enforce that ideology fight for. And if we're going to defeat the system, we have to overcome it. I, 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 and, and often the logic of workers' struggles does this. I had some examples I don't think I'll have time, um, time to go into overall, but you know, there are often times when what workers are doing to fight their bosses, raises political implications. Who's in control? Who decides who goes in and out of the factory? Who is, um, you know, in, in the case of the, the Greek um, state broadcaster, Ert, workers on one level, what could be more economic than fighting against redundancy from your boss? But it's also fighting about who's in control of the media and having workers control of, of, of the media for a year. On the other hand, whenever we've been involved in what seem like political movements separate from economics, wouldn't they be stronger where we're able to, to, to bring them into the workplace? In the movement against the Iraq war, there were one or two very isolated strikes against it. Fair enough. But actually, we were arguing at the time that there should have been and could have been more. And so I think um, that I'm going to have to stop, but that <laughs> there is an extent to which Palantis's separation and autonomy between politics and economics, there is a kernel of truth in it. But his theory both overstates it, and I would argue makes a virtue of the thing that if we're ever going to win, we have to overcome. And, you know, that's not to explain everything that's happening now. But I do think it gives an idea of why in the debates about what sort of party we need and, and things now, there's a lot of people that talk as if you can outsmart capitalism, and capitalism in reality still doesn't seem to have noticed it's been outsmarted. Right, question really. Um, well, comment first. I mean, for some of my generation politically, um, when I was first coming into revolutionary politics, the arguments around Palantis were quite current and we sort of engaged with them. Um, so I remember you mentioned the Miliband Palantis debate, and suddenly I thought, hang around, I remember reading about that, you know, whenever it was back in the mid to late 70s, whenever, whenever that, that, that was uh, taking place. But it seems to me those, those, that debate and that argument has gone quite really. I mean, you know, it's not really something that I've, you know, the main balance is not really something that I've sort of thought about or engaged with for a long, long time until obviously uh, more recently. And obviously the context of Syriza I think is, is really important in that respect. So I think it's, you know, just to say, I think it's been really useful to just to remind for my, myself personally, remind myself about some of those arguments and, re and refresh and rehearse some of those ideas. But I suppose the question I've got really, is, I suppose, does relate back to Syriza and Greece. And one of the things that I was interested in when you talked about is this idea of fragility, really. Um, the idea that in Palantis' view of the state, um, 
that the capitalist state is quite a fragile entity because it is this site of, I think that's what you're suggesting, it, it, because it is a site of conflict between different, uh, different um, class forces, etc., etc. And I just wonder about that in the context of the Syriza strategy <coughs> that they pursued since January, uh, and whether, I, I don't know if I'm being naive about this or whether... <coughs> Whatever, but it, it seemed to me that, that when Saritza came in, in in January and they sent you know, the negotiating team of Varoufakis and all that stuff you know, off to negotiate, I mean, maybe they were just being showing bravado, but they just they did seem to, you know, the, the image they projected was one that, you know, we've won this election, we can now go in and have this argument about uh, about what they're trying to do in terms of the, uh, 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 and we will. You know, we will be able to exploit the differences within the EU, the sort of difference between, between the French and the Germans and whatever, and, and the thing will crack apart, basically, and, you know, we will be able to prevail in that, in that context. And I just wonder to what extent that strategy, if it was their strategy, has its base in, in that sort of understanding of, of, I suppose, an understanding based on that reading of plants as the idea that the state, in terms of the European ruling class, are actually quite a fragile entity, uh, and I think the truth is they've shown themselves to be far more muscular and, and resolute than that in terms of what seems to be happening over, over yesterday and today and whatever. Thanks. <coughs> yeah, Ian Ferguson, Glasgow SWP. It kind of follows on for James's comment. Uh, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, the, Speaker made reference to Marx not having developed a theory of the state. I think my understanding was he'd, he'd, he'd planned to do it, but just never quite get around to it. Uh, but I do think it's interesting, and again, there's an article in the, the, the current issue of New Left Review by Mike Davis, which is also looking uh, at some of these issues and also harking back to the writings of 1848 to 51. And I think there, there's also, I think, a good reason for that, because I think for, for, for the reasons that kind of Dave said, I think because the different sections of the ruling class are, are, are kind of constantly fluctuating. There are different forms of state formations. Uh, I think Marx's writings and the 18th Premier and so on are some of his most concrete writings. And I think you know, that, that, that part of it is if we're going to analyse the role of the state, it does particularly require a very concrete analysis of the concrete formations that are actually taking place to work out what the different different va variations are. Uh, and again, you know, we, we, we talked about the, you know, talked about the, the, the MPs' expenses and so on, but obviously over issues like, for example, Europe, where we're about to see the main part of the ruling class tearing itself apart, uh, then I think, that, you know, I think that's fine. I think having said all of that, there does seem to me be a sense in which uh, they also know very well where their interests are. So the notion, and I suspect it was part of Syriza's strategy, I assume, to try and exploit uh, the differences between, for example, German capital and some of the, some, some of the other sections, and it's clearly a strategy that appears to have failed pretty spectacularly. Uh, which kind of brings me on to the second point, which is, I think is, is that it does seem to me that if we look at whether we look at the Syriza experience, whether we look at Egypt, whether we look at Chile, uh, that actually the ruling class, uh, whatever their differences may have, also have a much better sense of their shared interests than our side. Uh, and, 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 and clearly seem to be able to develop a better strategic uh, orientations and I suppose maybe that it kind of ends with a question because I guess that the only way that we can actually hope to counter that is that the whole basis of the Revolutionary Party is actually uh, that we can actually develop a, a strategy for our side which can then become he he hegemonic and can actually counter the organisation that they are able with all their much, much greater resources to, 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 to put forward. And I suppose I just wondered, because it's also a very long time since I've looked at Palancis, but just wondered also uh, how much at all, or what did he see as, as the role uh, of the Revolutionary Party? Thanks. Um, Alex? Well, first of all, I'd like really to thank Dave for an excellent talk, which, um, to be honest, made Poulantas much clearer for anyone who's tried to read him and much more reasonable than the, often, uh, the reader often, often finds. So I thought it was very, very valuable. I think, so, secondly, just in terms of how um, Poulantas is relevant to the debate about Greece, I don't know. God knows what books Tsipras has read, but... Um, I, d I don't think he is in any sense influenced by Poulantzas. It's more people on the left of Syriza who might look towards Poulantzas. So, Stathis Kouvelakis, um, 
who's extremely critical of what's, what the Greek government is currently doing, has also said that Poulantas is relevant to the, the, the Greek situation. Now, I think the, what, it's not exactly a disagreement with Dave, but I think that it's important to see that there's an evolution in Poulantas' writing, and there are two key books. There's Political Power and Social Classes, which was published in May 68. Perfect timing. It became a bestseller. You know, that's the book that made Poulantas famous. It's a very formalistic, abstract and formalistic book, but it's written from a revolutionary position. So I remember reading the Miliband Poulantas debate, and I suppose sided with Poulantas because Poulantas said, Miliband says the problem is personnel, so that means, you know, if we have the right people in government, then everything will be okay, <coughs> but we need to smash the state. Now, he does it from a kind of Maoist position, um, very much reflecting the mood of radicalization in France, where he was based at the end of the 1960s. The other key book is State Power Socialism, written quite shortly before he died in 19, I think it was published in, in 78. And there his position, there he shifted to a left-wing Eurocommunist position, this position where the state uh, reflects the balance of class forces, which Dave criticized very, very well. And I think that there, actually, um, uh, there's a, the, this is a question on which, which actually Althusser was uh, better than Poulantzas. There's an article that was only published long after Althusser's death uh, called Marx in His Limits, where he discusses the late Poulantzas position of a state that reflects the balance of class forces. And Althusser says, the problem with this position is it underestimates the unity of the state. And I think that's a key point. Um, the state isn't just an agglomeration of different institutions just reflecting different pressures. That's essentially the <coughs> mainstream pluralist conception of the state as something that you know different, different interest groups uh, can influence. There's a unity to the state that reflects the importance of certain core institutions, which are partly the civil service, the army, also the courts. You know, when we talk about reactionary interventions, it's often the courts who play a very, very important role that are very tightly hooked up with the core sections of the, of the, of the ruling class. And the fact that Poulantzas flips from apparently very hard revolutionary position to this, um, I think, in, I mean, in some ways more open, in some ways weaker position in the late 1970s, reflects the fact that he never properly explained in the, the first book, Political Power and Social Class, why it is that the state, okay, the state is relatively autonomous, but it still functions to reproduce capitalism. He never explains why it does. It's just a kind of theoretical axiom. And I think partly it was politics, and probably more important it was politics, but it was also that theoretical weakness that explains his evolution. I have a great teacher. Chris Newell of the Socialist Worker Student Office. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think you get the sense of him sort of looking at um, the top of society, the, the, the splits and the sort of class fractions. Obviously, I think that's very important in terms of analysis um, about how you sort of uh, change society. But I think you get such a like, detailed account of the different splits in, in class fractions, but there's no strategy that follows on for it, from it, from the, uh, the working class. I think he doesn't really talk, he, he mentions mass struggle in state power and socialism and doesn't really say anything about the way forward as such. Um, and I think also in terms of um, when he talks about the civil servants and I think he implies you know, that civil servants in the state can be radicalised and somehow you can sort of form alliance with them. He also says, it's like one or two sentences where he says, but don't scare them. You know, they're radicalising so don't be too revolutionary and kind of scare them off. Which again I think is kind of about restricting the struggle to certain <coughs> limits. I think as well, when he talks about dual power um, and, and re rejects the idea of the dual power approach, um, and then he, he says, you know, we can have the capitalist state and we can also have workers and community councils. I mean, dual power is, you know, the existence of two different sites of power in society, but the thing is that that has a time limit. 
you know, one side has to win out over the other one. And I think, you know, he never really discusses how you could have maybe a workers' council or a community council control in the place. And, you know, um, a left wing government running a capitalist state, I think one would still have uh, come in conflict with the other one. Um, also, I just got a quick question. Is like someone said to me that they felt like reading state power and socialism, um, that all the arguments actually leading up to, until the end are kind of arguing that the state can't be reformed. And then the last, the conclusion is there's a democratic road to socialism, you know, so support, you know, a kind of left wing version of Euro communism. I mean, do you think that's the case? Right, so it's my role to speak when no one else wants to speak. Um, so I just got another specific question about something you raised, Dave, which is, sorry, just a particular question about something you raised. I was intrigued when you said about, unless I misheard you, what Francis had to say about Chile, because um, I think you said that he said the, the problems in Chile that they didn't go, that they weren't radical enough. Is that right? Uh, because I, I'd always, assume, I mean, my general reading about Eurocommunism was that you know, Chile was one of the great founding crises out which Eurocommunism developed, which was precisely the opposite argument, that really I ended went too far and was too radical, and the historic compromise in Italy, etc., et came out of that. So I was intrigued by that, um, and uh, so I just wanted you to re respond to that. Great. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I, I just wanted to make the point that I suppose if you're in a revolutionary tradition, you want to see the revolution and you believe that without that revolution you can't have that so, um, socialism in, within one country. But there is the practical problem of what happens when the left wins power in somewhere like Venezuela or, or, or Greece and what sort of programme when the left has won power in an alliance with a whole group of, of a united front, which, in, which is what Syriza and other, other organisations are, with a whole load of, of reformists and things. And so there is, in that sense, a theoretical vacuum which Buzalis and others were trying to, to fill insofar as what does, the, uh, does, uh, does that left government do? Now, I believe that you can't have that left government allowed to be in power because um, on its own, because the other capitalists of the world like, will start bullying them, like we've seen in Venezuela and organising coups, or in, in the case of Greece, the um, ganging up from the European institutions. And so I suppose there is a vacuum, I don't think it's one that a revolutionary socialist could fill, but there is a vacuum for somebody to think about whether they can do some theory as to what, what should happen when the left wins power in a, in a country. Um, the revolutionary socialist argument is that it needs to internationalise it. But um, Puzalis and others, I suppose, are thinking on a continent-wide basis as to what should happen. And this is why there's an interest in it at the moment. If, if, it, if it's a limited um, capturing of the state power rather than, a, rather than, a, a, the, 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 than an overthrow of the state. Go on. Um, well, I hesitate to speak because I haven't particularly read Palantis, although Dave's done quite a good job of enthusing me to to, uh, to do it. Although I take Alex's warning about that. But I, so, but uh, first of all, just so it's a couple of thoughts really. One is that there's clearly some truth to the argument that the state is a site of class struggle, uh, not just because of the point that Dave made, which is an important one about. That you know the kind of class base of many of the kind of you know uh, in civil servants and so on have effectively been proletarian. It's important, but you know some element of partial disintegration of the core oppressive apparatus is a necessary precondition of a successful revolution. Unless section of the army, the particular kind of squaddies and so on, can be won to a revolutionary movement, it's hard to see how you can break through decisively. But if the entire core state apparatus simply disintegrated, it wouldn't be necessary to have a revolution. And, and, and the core of it does remain. In other words, you split the army and the repressive apparatus. This is part of the revolutionary process. Secondly, and I think coming closer to some of the debates around left governments and left reformism and what's taking place in Greece, you see, I think that, you know, having for years been really confronted by quite right-wing, social, liberal versions of reformism, we're now seeing much more left-wing versions emerge. And one of the most important arguments, so put forward in 
socialist review by uh, a man called Ed, Ed Rooksby arguing this position quite effectively in some ways, that what you need is a combination of above and below. What you need is both moves for kind of left governments, but supported by extra parliamentary <coughs> mass movements. Of course, comrades, you're right in your critique of left governments, but if they're supported by mass movements that can keep them honest, this is a much more realistic strategy than the kind of Leninist uh, path. And I think that the argument I think you really have to put, and I think there is a criticism of Palancers here, is it's not true that they carry equal weight. One, it, the movement, either the electoral project, the parliamentary project, subordinates a mass movement to its aims, or the mass movement has to subordinate <coughs> an electoral project. One of these win out, they're not equal. And you get a glimpse of this in Greece, in the sense of you did see Cyprus begin to try and mobilise people <coughs> last week, but now they're dismissed as a stage army, well it does a deal. Um, and, and our message is that there is a role for developing electoral work and parliamentary work, but it always has to be subordinate to the mass movement. Now, because crucially, our message to working class people isn't we can liberate you, or left parliamenta parliamentarians can liberate you, but only through your own struggles can you liberate yourself. Uh, and that's a hard message that goes against much of the common experience growing up under capitalism as working class people. But it's one that we have to relentlessly and be persistently clear that uh, this kind of dual approach of parliamentary and extra parliamentary, one, has to, one side has to be stronger and subordinate the other, and only the extra parliamentary, particularly with roots in the workplace, has a capacity <coughs> to present such a challenge to capitalism, you could begin to fragment its class state, but even that requires a decisive confrontation in the end. Thanks, Okay. <coughs> yes, Alex. Sorry, just trying to keep the... Yes, thank you. Going. This may be unpopular because of the heat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll try that very quickly. Um, I just wanted to respond to what you were saying, where you were presenting there sort of two issues. There's a reform or revolution, and then there are the problems of a left government. And they're, you know, two separate domains of theorizing. But I don't think that's true. I mean, and we see this very clearly in Greece. You know, well, it's true um, uh, that uh, Tsipras and Syriza weren't trying to carry through a revolution, they were just trying to stop austerity and implement very limited, limited reforms. What's happened to them is that all the power of capital has descended on their heads. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, so that the, the problem of reform or revolution is, is there, you know, what, what are the limits? It's true, as, as Mark was saying, we're now seeing, well, we've seen one left government in Europe, very significant change, break with social liberalism and so on, maybe we'll see a, a Podemos government. I think that's much less likely for all sorts of, all sorts of reasons. But, um, but then, then when we have this, this break in the established political order, a logic that comes into play, which is exactly the, the, the logic that operates in the case of reform or revolution. Of course, the dream of the reformist is there's this separate space, you know. You can go off and be a revolutionary, but while we get on with the practical stuff of making people's lives better, sorry, sorry you're not. That's the truth. Um, and the only way to, to, to counter the power of capital concentrated in the, in the EU is to mobilize the kind of power from below that we saw <coughs> displayed in the, in the referendum, but then, if that power were mobilised, then, you know, why stop at rejecting the mem memorandum? All sorts of possibilities become open that take you in a revolutionary direction. So I don't think there are these two separate boxes. Um, so with that, so we'll do our last day to come back and answer some of these points. Okay, well, I mean, thanks for the discussion. Though brief, it, I think it has usefully brought out some of the some of the points that I could have been clear on. I think Alex is absolutely right to say there's a transition in, in Palancis and a, 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 a shift through his work. And anyone who has decided they want to read something, read State Power and Socialism. If you're going to read Political Power and Social Classes, put aside a year. That would be my <laughs> advice. Um, I think it's true to say that there's, um, I remember who raised it, but there's, there's a, an issue with internationalism in his theory, that actually in State Power and Socialism, one of the sort of quite complicated bits because he describes the role of the, the nation and the state in constituting modern society at the same time as classes were being constituted, which to a large extent is true, but he draws from this the conclusion that the nation will persist beyond capitalism and therefore that the site of struggle that we're involved in to a large extent is the nation.
and that I think this is quite problematic for, for those of us arguing for, for international revolution. Um, it's also absolutely true, I think Chris mentioned, uh, no, someone else, that, that there's a, um, he talks about other classes that you have to win over in terms of their fear of the working class, and that's certainly true. I think, he, I think it's in political power and social classes, so early Palantis, that he describes the fear of the working class as being the thing that is always present when one of the non-ruling classes, if you like, is supporting the state, it's always to some extent due to fear of the working class. Now there may be an element of truth there, but it's precisely what conclusion do you draw from it? Because actually the working class can also lead fights that either make other classes irrelevant or that inspire them to join it. And I think emphasising not wanting to scare them too much is, is, it leads to a political problem as well as a theoretical one. Um, about them not having done enough in Chile, See, he's talking specifically about economically, and that's what reads bizarre, because, yeah, you always think about, well, what would you say about Chile? Well, he's not talking about in confrontation with the state. He's saying that when in confrontation with the state, they hadn't done enough <coughs> to change the economy and thus sap the power of their enemies within the state, whereas in Portugal there were experiments with workers' control, this was too much. And it's sort of missing the point, <laughs> in many ways, of... of um, you know of what the state actually actually did to them and um, I think it's yeah this was you Chris it's, it's certainly true to say that talking about workers councils and democracy at the base at the same time as a capitalist state is trying to have your cake and eat it that's not dual power that's sort of dual sites if you like of the same power you know workers councils will either get co-opted by the state they'll get crushed by the state or else they'll have to defeat the state and I think having your cake and eating it is a lot of what this theory is about, actually. And um, it's certainly true, um, I, I, again, as Alex said, that it's not that this is what's informing the series of um, leadership or, or, or Alexis Tsipras, but lots of the people who are invested in Syriza, not just in Greece, but who are emotionally invested in it in other countries, who are trying to replicate it, it's those people. That, that, that do you think you can do this to some extent? I think I was at a, a, a meeting hosted by Left Unity, Syriza and Podemos a few months ago, and there were arguments about the um, Italian Marxist party, Rifondazione Comunista, that we often use as an example. It joined a coalition government, got held for doing terrible things, and was punished as a result. Well, people were describing this and saying, well, the important thing then is that you have the movements and the party independent for each other, that the party's there and the movements aren't you know, going to get co-opted with what it's doing. Actually, this is the opposite of what we need. I think most of us who've tried to intervene in, um, in struggles as revolutionaries will have been told, keep politics out of this. And what you mean is, keep any challenge to whoever's in charge out of it, keep a challenge to the authority of the union bureaucracy out of it, keeping politics out of the movements, that's a terrible, terrible idea, that's, that's an argument for bureaucratism. And the other hand, the autonomy of politics, well precisely that means their electoral politics, that means you have people pursuing an electoral project, getting into the state, not held to account by those who are struggling on the ground. Both sides of the division are bad for the movement, but what do they re reflect? They reflect reformism. They reflect a sense that this terrifying thing that you're asking us to be able to do, can we find a way to go around that? And I think it's natural that when people are trying out, you know, questions of how do we change the world, that they look to, to, to <coughs> solutions like that. And, um, and that that's the case for, I suppose, trying to engage with this and, and, and to make the argument for why you can't go around the, the ruling class's state, you, you have to go through it and smash it. <laughs>